Nice to see you all. You're in London? Looks, looks yes, good. I'm in London. Okay. So we are already on YouTube live streaming. Mm -hmm. It's your, it, it's a taste of your popularity, right? <laughs> <laughs> So now we are live on YouTube and we have started recording. Yes, we are recording. Yes, we are recording. One, just one minute left. Hi, Yanis from Greece, your island. <laughs> Wow, KJ looks really great. <laughs> yeah. You look handsome, KJ. Uh, this is, uh, <laughs> Should I stop my video? So, so I'm going to put all on mute except Swati. Swati will start the introduction. Okay. So, so greetings to everyone and I welcome one and all on behalf of the core committee of Chris IS Org. I extend my heartiest welcome to all of you for joining today here on Zoom and also connecting us on Facebook Live from across the world. Today is the eighth episode of the In Conversation series that portrays prominent innovation scholars of the day in the form of intellectual bibliographical interviews. The idea is to understand the evolution of intellectual being himself that is very important, not only to grasp the core idea of their research, but also it gives a roadmap, a sort of optimism in the upcoming generation of researchers. So we are also uh, overwhelmed by the response this series is having from across the world. And uh, we thank uh, each one of you for that. Today is a special event. We are having with us Professor Kun Lee, Distinguished Professor, Department of Economics, Seoul National University, South Korea. He held the position of Vice Chairman of National Economic Advisory Council for the President of Korea and the Chairman. Winner of 2014 Schupeter Prize, Professor Lee has done his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, USA. It will be interesting to know his academic, professional, and personal transformation from being a student of BA economics in Seoul National University in early 1980s to climbing up the ladder and becoming distinguished professor in the same department. Professor Lee will be in conversation with another very prominent scholar of innovation studies, Professor KJ Joseph. Director of Gulati Institute of Finance and Taxation. He is the founding editor of a very prominent journal of innovation studies called Innovation and Development. He is also founding editor and chief of another journal called Kerala Economy, which is published by GIF. He, he was the president of Global Lakes, which is an Ekarom Prop global network for economies of learning, innovation, and competence building system. He was Ministry of Commerce Chair Professor at Center for Development Studies, CDS Trivandrum, India. Professor KJ has published extensively in the area of science, technology, and innovation for development, broadly and a specific focus on information technology, electronics, and also on plantation agriculture. He has also published seven books, including one, an edited volume uh, called Handbook of Innovation System in Developing Countries, along with Professor Lundwall, Christina Gemanade, and Jan Van. So I welcome you both uh, in, in, in today's session. 
about the program this program is about is going to be about for for 2 hours we will begin with one to one conversation between professor kunli and professor kj joseph for one hour and then we are going to have a break five minutes break only and in the next one hour we are going to join by the panel of eminent scholars and we are glad they have already joined professor john matthews uh from sydney professor petro pong is here from gris uh, japan professor chai sung uh, uh peter lim from konkung university south korea uh, uh they will be asking question to professor kun lee followed with an open house q and a from the audience so with this i hand over this virtual stage to professor kj and uh, the stage is your professor kj please thank you dr swati uh it is indeed a great pressure to be in the group of uh, anyone from globalix globalix is a unique community and wherever we meet regardless of you are in the east west north or south the kind of cordiality the friendship the dialogue and the environment of learning that it generates differentiates this network from many others and in fact one of the important offshoot from this network during the pandemic period is the remarkable amount of dynamism shown by some of the offspring of globalix the dynamic young generation from globalix and we have seen two of them today and there are many others one i am referring to dr rajesh and dr swati and many others they joined together and started certain wonderful initiatives the first in the series was a lecture series in the name of none other than chris freeman whom we all adore and respect and we draw inspiration from and that is a highly successful event after that they embarked at another con in conversation series that's again at another innovation in the art of learning and we are in the seventh or and i have been unfortunate that i have not been able to participate in all of them of course i have been following it through the whatsapp through the facebook and i have great great appreciation for all those who have worked behind and put up lot of energy time and enthusiasm they have shown for it and today we are in the at another event like this wherein we are going to have a dialogue with uh, none other than our great friend and a great uh, uh, i would say colleague professor kunli you we all know that in the late 50s and late 60s when we were talking about asia it was never ever thought about a continent or a group of countries with any great potential i draw your attention to the writings by gunnar middel the so called asian drama from asian drama what we expected that particular although he was focusing more on the south asian countries he did not find any scope for any kind of catch up any kind of remarkable transformation that we have seen during the last 4 to 5 decades from that asian drama to the today's dramatic asia today we say that 21st century is asia century and i am inclined to believe that these kind of conversations are in fact a process of understanding our economies 
in its manifold dimensions than what we know today through our highly competent learned professional colleagues from globalics we have with us led by professor kunli about his professional career uh, his uh, trajectory uh, I, 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 i'll deal with a little bit later and we have with us chasing you and uh, john matthews and patra pong and all these three four um, together has brought to get so much of scholarship and two hours which we are going to spend together with them i'm sure we will be much much more informed at 7:30 than we are today and that is going to be the purpose of the whole session while celebrating the great contribution made by professor kunli in fact uh, i know professor kunli uh, right from 2003 in fact uh, i was introduced to global x by none other than my great friend uh, professor patra pong who is here and later only i came to know about uh, professor um, kunli and i had a wonderful opportunity of working with him in a project on industry academy interaction and i know that all those who are in the panel are the scholars worked with him and all of you know that he stands head and shoulders above everyone in this group in terms of the collaborative work that he has done the manner in which he has promoted his students the manner in which he has collaborated and worked together with the scholars across the globe and that in fact the kind of learning that he has been acquired that he has acquired has got manifested in remarkable achievements in from uh, 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 in his professional career which uh, i will spend a little bit of time i thought that is very very important and uh, professor kunli is at present the distinguished professor of seoul national university and he is the head of the center for comparative economic studies he is a fellow of cfr canada and the founding director of the center for economic catch up in fact i have been with him in korea Uh, as part of the activities of the center for economic catch up and now he is the chairman of chairman of the board of uh, 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 center for economic catch up he is the winner of as already said winner of 2014 shumbiter prize for his monograph shumbiter analysis of economic catch up brought out by cambridge university oh, yeah. uh, he is also an editor of the research policy you know research policy is the most rated journal in our discipline in our area of interest in 2021 he served as the vice chairman of the national economic advisory council for the president of south korea at president himself is the chairman he is also a regular writer for project syndicate he served as the president of the international shumbiter society from 2016 to 2018 a member of the committee of the development policy of united nations from 2013 to 2018 a gfc member of the world economic forum from 2016 to 2019 he obtained his phd in economics from university of california berkeley his total citations received so far is over 12000 with an h index of over 49 this is very little to say about professor kunli if you look at the number of awards the manner in which he has slowly moved up the professional trajectory if i look at the single authored books that will clearly send give us an idea clearly in 2000 latest one you know this is the china's technological leapfrogging and economic catch up a shumbiterian perspective and the art of economic catch up 
barriers, detours, and leapfrogging Cambridge University Press in 2019. <coughs> Again, I said about the Trump tier analysis of economic catch up in 2013. Then, economic catch up and technological leapfrogging a path to development in Korea 2016 by Edward Elgar. New East Asian economic development, interacting capitalism and socialism, a book in 1993. Chinese firms, one of the Panoch's first books was Chinese firms and the state in transition. That's based on his PhD dissertation. It was published, uh, yeah. The point which, uh, you know, if you look at his publication in terms of articles, in all the professional journals in leading with innovation, science policy, you find Professor Kionli making presence. And I will tell him, tell us, tell you about his enormous contribution in four terms. I think 2006, nine onwards to 2000, he has been working uh, associated with the Global Access Board member. And uh, in addition to that, when you talk about uh, <coughs> his publications, it's a quite long list. Other professional activities that, uh, you know, apart from the major. Uh, research grants that he has got. His other professional activities an international uh, five year joint research sponsored by CIFAR Canada via program on innovation, equity, uh, 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 equity and prosperity. That's the program started from 2019. A major international research project on past and future trajectory of Korean capitalism. Global future. Council of World Economic Forum, the catch up project wherein Professor Curley worked with Nelson, Frango Marebra, and others. And uh, Global X International Shumbito Society, you know, Shumbito Society, he has been, in, in fact, uh, he has been a major leading role here that he has played and the various uh, activities that he has uh, organized, Shumbito in conferences. The way manner in which he has promoted Sikalix, the way in which he has promoted work for Globalix, I mean, these are all that uh, will remain in the minds of Asian scholars. And also, in addition to that, he was uh, involved in the GDN project of the World Bank and the various conference organizers therein. And he has also involved in the white power related activities. And equally important. You know, our Mecca, he was he's actively involved with uh, UNU wider and the colleagues over there. So when we look at, uh, you know, his work, what I see is that what has bothered Professor Kuhn Lee is something that Dennis and others asked in the 60s. Why growth rates differ? They asked at that time. He asked the question, how to facilitate in his term, the catch-up. How to facilitate catch-up of the countries and regions that lag behind. His analysis is not so much macro. His analysis is highly rooted and grounded in the behavior of the basic economic agents like firms. To what comes to my mind is a remarkable article by he and Franco wherein he they articulated, they build on to the concept of window of opportunity by Carlotta Perez and others and uh, Luke Sut and others. They further build on to that. They articulated how to explain the Chinese, sorry, how to articulate the South Korean miracle that was in fact, that engaged this number of scholars from Ali Samstrom and other, others. And as early as in 1984, in an influential article, in economic journal by none other than Professor Amartya Sen, he said about Korea. He was analyzing the performance of China, today Sri Lanka and Kerala, using the, those days world development indicators. He was answering so, the multilateral organizations which were advising the developing countries to follow the Southeast Asian tigers because they followed the magic of market. This was the advice. You leave things to market, things will get done. 
And at that time, his response, Professor Watia's response was that if you see Walra, if you if you see uh, uh, in 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 if you, you will see in in South Korea, Walra's auctioneer moving around with the whip in the one hand and white paper on the other. Clearly state, clearly doing a role of both carrot and stick. Influencing the behavior of while they promoted the chibols, how they have been, how that, the modulating the behavior. It is not a passive state. It is more of a more a proactive state. Here comes Professor Culey, building on to that. In the late 90s, he was trying an altogether different perspective to the catch-up process, following Shumbhichar and putting up front the role of innovation therein. So, and you can see, I, here again, I can see some kind of similarity in terms of Professor Ahmad Yasin, the way in which he has articulated capabilities and freedoms in 1970s. Professor Ahmad Yasin was also in 1970s, he was a choice of technique man. In 1961, he wrote at the year in which many of our youngsters were not born, he wrote an article in Oxford Economic Journal with Ahmad Yasin in terms of uh, how to make your investment. Later, he articulated capabilities and freedoms and gave new dimensions to understanding of the development process. Just like that, he built on to the basic concepts. Similarly, I can see how Professor Curley, building on to the concept of the below windows of opportunity and the catch-up process, and in that process, how the middle-income traps get formed and his different articulations of how countries which are lagging behind, why do they lag behind? So what I'm trying to say is that here is a scholar whom I would rate him as the Asian tiger in the innovation studies. Professor Kurli, welcome. And hats off to you. Let me take, first of all, congratulate you on behalf of the whole Global X community and the, the initiative and, the, uh, and all those who are assembled over here. And with these words, I would like to you know that we are going to have something like a two hours I know you are not a man who, Asians, particularly Indians, talk a lot, don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> but Chinese and other Southeast Asian countries, they don't talk much, but they are fast doers. So the, you don't talk much, you do fast. So <laughs> let me ask you to begin with, what do you consider the most important contribution that you made? And you know, there is so much, I, if at all, if you can, one, then I'll we'll build on to that. Thank you, uh, KG. Uh, many thanks for your very strong and detailed uh, introduction of uh, me as a scholar. And you already uh, explained a lot of uh, uh, my research and my uh, 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 career. Okay. So your first question uh, we have discussed is about what will be my uh, most important contribution? And uh, I'll just say, uh, I can say from based on my uh, 2001 uh, research policy article written with uh, Chae Sung Nim here, uh, that's about raising the question of uh, late commerce doesn't necessarily follow the same path of income and foreign economies. We can create our own path, sometimes keep some stages. And that's the uh, all most important ideas then I keep following, uh, uh, digging that question uh, in my follow research. And I have some answer from my 2013 book, which got Shimpet Award, saying that you can use innovation system concept to analyze the path of latecomers. You can predict uh, where catching up is difficult, where catching up is easier than others. So, there comes uh, this concept of uh, cycle time of technology, cycle time. And uh, I found that Lakramer tend to specialize in show cycle technology-based sectors. That's the different path because incumbent countries all strong in long cycle technology sectors. So that's an example of we are doing different paths or trajectory. And uh, I think that, that would be uh, my uh, important uh, contribution. And I am keep adding more on these uh, uh, key ideas using different uh, methodology and the research uh, 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 methodology.
Yo, I'm with you. Please unmute, KJ. Yeah. I, I'm muted. Okay. Now, now, fine. now, it's good. now okay. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. I think uh, uh, I appreciate. I, I, I just wanted to say that any human being is a creation of the circumstances, the environment that we are put into. So I'm sure the manner in which your thought process, how you have been evolved, as a scholar and make this important contribution. How it was made possible? Could you please give me a, a kind of a trajectory of uh, 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 your professional trajectory in terms of your early, you know, uh, uh, early, early, early days and how you have, because that's very important because you may also like to highlight the, the influential factors such that the young scholars who are participating in this meeting may be able to benefit from that. Could you please give me a kind of a account? Yeah, that's, of the, that's the most important part of our uh, session today. <laughs> and uh, as you know, my uh, uh, research is called uh, economics of catching up. Then I would say as a scholar, I'm also catching up. So there is a, uh, this is sort of my catching up as a scholar in this field of innovation studies. Then applying my uh, catch-up cycle theory, I would say there are several windows of opportunity for me to grow as a scholar. <laughs> okay, so um, so my answer will be based on this uh, framework. So I think the one of the important windows was my attending uh, European Summer School of Industrial Dynamics in 1998, held in Korsika. So at the time I was a uh, uh, very young scholar and I was uh, listening to lectures by Franco, Dozi, Maurice Jubal and all others. That's the first account of me uh, uh, in person of those uh, teaching by uh, innovation scholars, okay? Then um, second momentum was my first attendance of Global Leaks in uh, 2004 held in Beijing. Okay? There I met uh, Richard Nelson. Then that's the when I got involved in his project of catch up. So he, he, we learned four projects of economic catch up. First on the uh, uh, sectoral innovation system, role of IPR, and uh, role of university in this linkages and so on. So I participate all those four themes project of catching up. That's why I uh, uh, grew up as a catch-up scholar, and that's more important windows opportunity. Okay, <laughs> then uh, as, as mentioned, uh, all the global leaks meetings. Uh, since then, I attended every meetings. There, I become to know all those scholars like uh, uh, Bento Kerumbal and others. And through this interaction, I grew up as a scholar. So I had to emphasize this part to other. Uh, uh, young scholars, uh, importance of attending this uh, networking and the conferences and so on. But to utilize this windows opportunity, you got to have some preparation. It's called bring up your absorptive capacity. That I did in Korea. So I had uh, formed a research group and uh, start reading the National Winter Book, 1982. I read it several times with my, this is my other cover. You see it's all <laughs> like, so uh, we, we studied this whole books and uh, also studied the 1988 important book in Schimpeton economics, the technical change in economic theory. So I read all the chapters. That's my preparation to utilize the window opportunity of meeting all the scholars. So based on those, uh, uh, my study, actually, I have to say also that uh, my doctoral thesis research was about innovation. My thesis about uh, China, China economic reform, system reform, changing from planned economy to market economy. So I studied the uh, economic reform in China state owned sectors. So my field was not innovation, it was on uh, competitive economic system or system transition. So 
I only turned to Inubian scholars uh, from mid-1990 after I studied these uh, several books and also after attending this 1998 European summer school. But through this uh, 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 collaboration work with my Korean students and colleagues, I wrote the papers of Korean industrial uh, catching up experiences. It was more or less descriptive analysis, what's, what's happening in Korean industries. Then only listening those lectures and learning, I applied Trinitarian framework or technical regime or in a system to rewrite my early papers in terms of the Schumpeterian framework. That was published in this research policy 2001 papers, which got uh, 1,500 uh, citation Google scholars. So without then my exposure to Schumpeterian economics, uh, my 2000 paper would not have existed. It just remained as a descriptive uh, uh, story of Korean industries. So, uh, uh, so, in other words, as a scholar, I'm catching up. <laughs> when I attended the European Summer School, uh, uh, I met with uh, Dosi Franco, but at the time, they didn't know me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just followed them. Only later through Global Leagues and so on, uh, uh, I was uh, being recognized as uh, uh, um, the growing scholars in the field. For example, I presented my uh, ICC uh, 2006 papers, linking technical regime to kind of catch up, presenting, uh, I think, Beijing uh, Global X. Uh, in their room, Frank was attending the presentation. That's where we got uh, get to know each other. Okay? So uh, those series of uh, event and encounter uh, was very important Windows opportunity for me to grow. Then later part, uh, I started to attending this uh, uh, Schumpeterian economics, uh, Schumpeterian society conferences. First one, 2001 uh, held in Manchester. Then 2010 held in Arbo. That's organized by the uh, uh, Bentoke and others. Then uh, 2014 conference held in Jena. That's where I got uh, Schumpeter prizes. So there are two associations, the Global Leagues and International Schumpeter Society. Uh, I owe these two organizations so much for me, realize catching up as a scholar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Without this, uh, I think uh, today is no, there is no me as a scholar. Okay. okay. Uh, could you please uh, articulate in terms of the the, the, the role that uh, the Global X Network, your association with the Global X Network, you know, it's rather, uh, 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 we are unfortunate that uh, Professor uh, uh, Bendaka Lundwal has got another uh, 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 engagement at the current time, this time, that's why he's not joining. Uh, it would be nice he also joins, but then uh, what you consider the role of the network globally explained in shaping your thought process uh, and, uh, and getting uh, or, or locating that particular window of opportunity hmm, that you have been able to pick up. <laughs> okay. So as you know, my, my research was initially motivated by, uh, motivated by Korean experiences or neighboring economies, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and many China. But that's uh, just Asian orientation. We got to have a test from a uh, scholar from other regions of continent. And in that regard, the Global Leagues and Schumpeterian Society IS has an uh, important role for me to expose, to, uh, interact with uh, scholars from different part of the world and different stories, and different uh, problem uh, storytelling. So they are, uh, through this interaction, I was able to make my argument more generalizable beyond the Asian context to have a certain uh, stylized effect or to the uh, status of a uh, new theoretical argument or even catch up theory. So as you know, Schumpeterian said that innovation is predictable, can be explained. 
That's where Shinpitian economics differ from neoclassical economics, which treat innovation as something exogenous, but we said this is indigenous. Then I apply such ideas of Shinpitian economics to context of catching up. So catching up can be predictable, can be explained, follow certain rule and law. And this can be generalizable beyond the Asian context to other parts of the world. Okay? So key lesson to realize catching up is build your capability. And second, utilize that capability in smart way in certain sectors. Otherwise, your effort or competence will be less best utilized. So you will make much success. Okay? Excellent. OK, uh, I think uh, I know that uh, our other panelists are also there. I think ideally they could have also joined, but nonetheless, you know, uh, there is a, a, a lot of talks going about in terms of uh, uh, the 21st century being going to be Asia century. Hmm? And uh, in terms of transitions as a scholar, truly, uh, interacted with and worked with the scholars from Latin America and Africa. How will you kind of articulate Asian trans transformation? How will you articulate that? Okay, so in the past, in the uh, early part of uh, post world, there was a theory called dependency. That means um, latecomers are not likely to achieve economy uh, progress or uh, catching up. Okay, so we are so much depressed <laughs> in terms of this prospect. Okay, but it's, it's from Asian experiences or Asian Asian tigers saying that we could achieve some catching up. Okay, from based on export orientation and so on. So in the regard, uh, uh, Asian experience or catching up export pioneered by early day Japan, followed by Asian tigers. Very important in global economic history. So latecomers, emerging country, uh, could realize their own uh, economy catching up. Okay? And that has to be explained with a different theoretical framework other than dependency theory or a little bit different from Latin American structuralism. Okay? So in that regard, I thought that it is, it is very important or, or obligation as uh, Asian scholars to try to make uh, this story as more or less theoretically based. Okay, why uh, those catching up happens in uh, Asian economies, much bigger uh, scale and speed than other continent. So I think that motivated me as a scholar, or almost I feel like is my obligation. So it doesn't have to be just description. Yet we based on some theory. The theory I found it is from Shinpitarian. Uh, economics, emphasize innovation, because neoclassical economics all focus on short-term economic phenomena. They can explain long-term economic changes happening in this global. But Schumpeterian emphasis innovation makes long-term economic change can be explained by emphasizing innovation. So I turn to uh, Schumpeterian economics to explain uh, Asian economics. And also uh, in my recent article in World Development, I, I apply the concept of a national immune system pioneered by uh, Nelson and uh, Lumbar. And I measured it using uh, pattern citation data. And I found that we have a different typology, types of NIS. And uh, uh, I found the two paths of catching up. One path is the uh, Korea, mainly China, and Taiwan path building on or specializing in soul cycle technology-based sectors. The other path is more balanced. So not extremely short, not extremely long, but medium cycle or some combination like India, like some combination of soul cycle IT services, or long cycle pharmaceutical bio. So India is unique cases of uh, not that fast, but steady catching up based on more balanced uh, Israel system balance between short and long. And there are other economies belonging to this group. Earlier cases, Spain, Ireland, Larsen Tree, even Singapore. So their balance also in terms of balance between manufacturing and services. Whereas 
the vice and experience, Korea, China is more into manufacturing based growth. So I find there are two different pathways of catching up. One is imbalanced short cycle, the other is more balanced medium cycle. Then there is, a, a, as you know, the middle income trapped economy, NIS. So this way, uh, I was able to utilize the concept of NIS to analyze not only this advanced economy, but also emerging economy. I was able to identify several different pathways, okay, trajectory. And that's I think, most important because in the mainstream economy, you used to say you got to emulate, imitate advanced economy as soon as possible. Okay? But that's wrong. We have to go opposite direction. Okay? That's the concept of detours. Okay? So long cycle sectors are hallmark of all advanced country. Long cycle is good. High profit, high entry variance. But if you target that too early, you will not make much success because you are facing high entry barriers, difficult to commercial success. So that's why you avoid those direct competition, but going into niche, which is short cycle, so a detour concept. So I think detour is very important in many uh, aspects. For example, Korea, my country, used to be a very authoritarian uh, rhythm country, so developmental dictatorship, most closed on the title controlled by uh, authoritarian government. But uh, we achieve economic growth ahead of other uh, countries. So it's also detours. Now Korea is most open economy, most democratic, but we used to be most closed and most austerian. So it's another political detours. Uh, economically, Korea is very protected, closed economy, but now Korea is only economy who has free trade with the US, EU, India, China, it's the most open economy. So to be open, you got to be closed for a while. That's also detour concept. So detour is a way to express we are facing diverse alternative pathways for catching up, not only one, but there are several. So not only manufacturing, we could utilize uh, IT services or resource-based sectors. Those are all possible options. So in the past, Development economics say that no other country join high income without bringing up certain size of manufacturing. I don't want to follow that idea. Okay. Key thing is that building up capability, technology, utilizing smart ways in different sectors for your most uh, profitable, uh, profitable sectors. That's okay. It doesn't have to be always manufacturing, it could be IT services or resource based sectors. So, uh, we, I think we, we have to open up in terms of seeking route to be a, a high income economy. And there are diverse routes, not only one path. And uh, in this new world of deglobalization, we are left open. We are left to do whatever thing we, we can do. Now, even US is adopting industrial policy protectionism. <laughs> so it's, the whole world is now turned down. Okay? So you are free to do whatever you want to do. Okay, you don't have to be a blame for bad industrial policies. Everybody's doing that. So I think it's a good opportunity for latecomers to explore their own paths, feel more free, uh, uh, not to be uh, bothered by others' uh, voices or uh, uh, dicta uh, the, the dictation, whatever. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, interesting uh, remark. But uh, at the same time, you know, if you look at uh, the experience of countries that uh, uh, shifted their gear or they have moved from what is called import substitution to export orientation or uh, state orchestrated policy regime to market driven policy regime in the last uh, uh, three to four decades. There is a kind of argument that uh, last two, three decades for many turned out to be lost decades. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, on the one hand, uh, we have seen remarkable uh, instances of uh, economic growth picking up uh, when uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore recorded high growth rate in the 80s. We from India and China, others said, no, these are small countries, they can grow. But we have seen a country like uh, China, recording growth rate of nearly 9% of 
uh, sustained for 30 to 40 years. So the at the same time, there are uh, different downsides of globalization. Uh, I don't want to elaborate upon all those. I know we have got Professor John Matthews and others, Patrapong and others. I'm not going to deal with that. To begin with, I just want to ask one question particularly, I'm sure uh, you might be able to, since you have done so much work on uh, what is called middle income trap and other related issues, the Cambridge School, you know, Ajit Singh and others, they have came up with the experience of de increasing deindustrialization. You know that in the 60s, uh, what uh, the advice given to the developing countries at that time was either industrialize or perish. And industrialization was given as the mantra for development. Mm -hmm. Today, what we find is that ladder that was available at that time for those days, developing countries is no more available. What you find is increasing deindustrialization process. Mm -hmm. Deindustrialization is nothing new. Mm -hmm. We know that. As per the question, that's, you know, the structural transformation as any country, when they cross the per capita income level of something like 10 to 15,000 US dollar, their share of manufacturing will come down. Mm -hmm. That is a part of the natural process of development. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, what we see here, after globalization or Playing with the globalization for the last 30 to 40 years is that countries are experiencing deindustrialization even before reaching uh, $2,000 per capita income. In India, for example, in 1950, the manufacturing share was 9%. From 9%, the manufacturing share increased to 16%. In the year 1996, 96 is important because that is the year in which India entered the WTO, I would say the accelerated globalization. Thereafter, although we went with many different measures to increase what is called the make in India, skilling in India, <coughs> national manufacturing policy, and we wanted to have 100 million employment in manufacturing, we wanted to raise the share of manufacturing to 25%, but we have not even moved a point forward. Of course, you will say that, okay, we have gained in services. But there are limits to service-led growth when it, when it happens in the early stage. You go to Africa, you can find instances of deindustrialization, not premature deindustrialization, Cambridge School would call them as deindustrialization without industrialization, without industrialization. Even without reaching a dollar 100,000 per capita income, they are deindustrializing. And Latin American story you are familiar with. So, what is your take on it? What do you think? How, how can yeah. we address this emerging issue? Yeah. Please, could you please? Important say? issues. Uh, I have to have several things to say about this issue of deindustrialization. First, those who are emphasizing industrialization, uh, they don't uh, tell much about uh, typical manufacturing uh, uh, giving us high entry barriers. So we need to find a strategy to find a niche for entry. We are looking for entry point. Mm -hmm. okay? And they didn't talk about that. Just say industry important. But my idea is that uh, the entry point should be where uh, technology is featured by show cycle. That's already I mentioned. Secondly, some countries' deindustrialization is caused by premature liberalization, market opening. That killed industry of growing in some Latin America or uh, African context. So I call it liberalization trap. We put in the present trap by opening, uh, we got de rooted all our uh, source of manufacturing or industrialization. So, 
uh, that's the second C. Thirdly, I can say that now, given uh, current situation, so what are the alternative? Then I would say I mention uh, some resource-based sectors can be alternatives. Examples are Chile and Malaysia. I think these two countries are next two economies after Asian tigers who will be growing beyond middle-income trap or escaping middle-income trap. And they are escaping trap, not based on any success in manufacturing, but based on their success in several resource-based sectors. For example, in Malaysia, it's palm oil, rubber product, petrol product, and so on. For Chile, it is salmon, fruit, like a uh, berry, and then wood product, and so on. So these are the their new growth engines. They are not just typical resource, but it's all innovation based, highly knowledge based, and not only targeting domestic market, but target all export market earning dollar. In comparison, IT manufacturing sector in Malaysia is typical example of middle income trap. They are doing some uh, exporting, but it's still uh, captured in the middle uh, end. Not reaching beyond high end. Okay. So in Chile, they are copper is biggest industry, but it's not copper for generating much dollars and, uh, and so on. But these three, uh, four resource sectors, they are the who are making progress, in generating jobs and generating uh, export. So I would say these two economies uh, might be good example, case of uh, catching up, not based on manufacturing, but based on uh, new resource-based sectors, uh, innovation-oriented and global market-oriented. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so I, this is what I say in other words, there is a bison catching up based on short cycle manufacturing, and there is an Indian case based on short cycle, but IT services, not manufacturing, then there is a resource base catching up in Chile, Malaysia, and so on. So we see that some say we are facing diverse alternative pathway of catching up. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, maybe an, a, a, a kind of uh, uh, a related question uh, uh, which I'm uh, interested is, uh, again, the Asian dynamics. Though you talk about the primacy importance of innovation, it is well articulated. Uh, I'm actually uh, holding, uh, quoting on to uh, Professor Patrapong's. You know, I remember his uh, uh, work uh, regarding uh, uh, Thailand, and that I thought it is very relevant for many other Asian countries as well that managed to kind of uh, uh, achieve. Uh, attract more investment, FDI-driven growth. So the question is actually, to what extent the modern Asian development is innovation-driven and to what extent it is investment-driven or to put it more in a different way, how widespread is the innovation Schumpeterian path in the Asian dynamics? Or, or, you know, or, or is it a kind of still remaining as islands of islands in the desert? You know, this innovation driven approach, you know, you can, you see in how widespread it is. How widespread, in, in India, I'm asking this question because in India, for example, mm -hmm. we have been trying to, uh, I will tell you a story as early as in 1986, when I went to a senior official's office in planning commission, he showed me a note in 1986 <coughs> saying that India should aim at 2% of the GDP as R&D. <laughs> because at that time, Korea had 2% as GDP going to R&D. Yeah. It was a time when India was aiming at India was preparing the eighth five-year plan. Now we have done away with the planning. That officer has become a minister. And he held the minister, central minister position, two or three positions uh, in portfolios, important positions. Even today, our R&D GDP ratio 
is not even 0.8%. Forget about 1%. And while China, for example, which has been able to record very high growth rate, their GDP growth rate, uh, GDP uh, ratio uh, is 2.2, 2.1 plus, I suppose. So what I want to ask you is, how uh, widespread is the innovation-driven growth dynamics in Asia? Since, you know, you. could you please so, reflect upon yeah. that? So another important issue by KJ. But you know, uh, innovation, driving growth is different from this R&D driven growth. So R&D is uh, input. And uh, depending upon your national system, your outcome of innovation quite, quite different. So you have to first think, distinguish R&D versus innovation, also innovation versus knowledge. Okay? So knowledge involves a lot of test knowledge, not only this uh, codified knowledge. So, Although we use R and D GDP ratio as a typical kind of indicators of innovation input, input, you know, our own concept of NIS is about effectiveness of same input. So if you have a better NIS, you end up better outcome, even if less amount of input or R and D. So I think if you just emphasize R and D uh, as indicators, you might. Be misread, misread by your different outcome and so on. So I think that's why we have to emphasize correctly the concept of innovation system. Okay? So uh, innovation system touch upon not only this explicit R&D activity, but also how to generate more synergy interaction among key innovation actors so that they can generate more output, even with the same amount of input. And that's the tricky part, more challenging part. And that's the challenge uh, facing for us, okay? Also, uh, uh, I, if I compare Korea and uh, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan spend less R&D than Korea, but they tend to have uh, much more output in terms of so. So this issue of uh, 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 indicators. And also another issue is that we have to distinguish technological knowledge versus scientific knowledge. Technical knowledge is measured by patent, whereas Scientific knowledge is measured by uh, scientific articles. Between these two, we have to have a right balance in dynamic uh, uh, stage of development. So many emerging countries spend a lot to R&D and uh, spend a lot to generate write more scientific articles. Many of them under never utilize at all, just uh, getting high rank in their uh, scientific article ranking. But that doesn't much help. That's the one of mis mistake which often happen in emerging countries, particularly in Africa or Latin America. They are very strong in scientific uh, knowledge generation, but never utilized because you don't have a, a effective NIS to take advantage of your knowledge. Whereas, at least in relative sense, patent representing technical knowledge is easier to be commercialized than scientific articles, even with uh, less efficient NIS. So I would say, uh, even if same R&D, you got to pay more attention to generating technical knowledge rather than scientific knowledge uh, uh, made by scientific articles. And we, many emerging countries, uh, don't distinguish these two, okay? So generating many articles, never utilized. <laughs> For that, we better, we better free ride scientific achievement by uh, uh, advanced countries. That's one thing I can say. Yes. The point is, uh, uh, you, you are actually going uh, that. I cannot hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just want to kind of take your uh, take on, you know, now Chinese development experience has, in fact, uh, has taken the world by surprise. Uh, it was once it was Japan. And uh, later it was followed by South Korea. Now we have the third champion in the row from Asia, that is China. So question number one is, as an Asian scholar, how will you kind of find the similarities and differentials in these three uh, champions of Asia? 
that if you could kind of reflect upon, then we can take up uh, maybe next as Chinese issue net separate way. Well, will you kind yeah. of, as an Asian scholar, yeah. something yeah. which I'm very yeah. sure, yeah. 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 What unique? So, yeah, as I uh, mentioned at, at the beginning, I, my doctoral thesis was about China. I can read, I, I speak Chinese. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in doing research in China. So uh, for me, uh, so my doctoral thesis was first published in the, uh, as a book. Uh, by that time it was about China's system transition. But recently, so several months ago, I published my second book solely on China in the name, the, the John Melton, the China's technological leapfrogging and economic catching up. So in the book, I try to uh, apply same Schumpeterian framework of inner system to explain China's uh, catching up, not only catching up, but also leapfrogging. China's is realizing uh, some leapfrogging as a, a late commerce and how the leapfrogging in technology leading to uh, economic catching up. So basically I have no problem with uh, applying this uh, uh, catching up framework uh, based on experience of uh, neighbors, such Japan, Asian type, to context of China. But one China factor is that unique factor is a huge uh, size of market. It is advantage for China because when you get uh, bargaining with multinationals in terms of technology transfer, your market size acting as uh, your bargaining powers, your bigger bargaining power. So you, you can get better deal in terms of this transfer. That's the one important momentum China utilize. And the China scale, scale means you can do many things at the same time, different part of China doing different things. So this scale and uh, uh, of your catching up is the biggest advantage, but still China is catching up first based on show cycle sectors. Okay, so and they are catching up, but in they are leapfrogging into many IT services, digital platform company, and some green growth, as uh, John might mention later. So China is not only catching up in typical manufacturing, but also leapfrogging in IT services, digital platform, and renewable energies and green industry. So uh, basic framework of our catching up sympathetic economics well applied to China better than typical neoclassical economics. They cannot explain China's growth well. They don't know how to explain this. <laughs> I think <laughs> we can do better job in explaining China's growth. It's not surprising for us. So um, actually the reason I chose China as my thesis topic in 1980 was that at the time when China began opening the policies, all American economists, say that, oh, China will not make a success. China will be facing failures. But I knew, because I grew up the same authoritarian cultures and so on. So I knew that if Korea made it, why China? Why not China? So I, I knew that China will make another success. That's why I chose China's economic opening and reform as my thesis topic. Yeah. Yeah. I have advantage as a Korean scholar. Uh, I have my own eye looking at China based on my current experiences because I used to live the same authoritarianism trying to fast catching up and so on. So um, I see some aspect of China which cannot be seen by Western scholars. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I have many questions, but the, my, our friends on the floor are raising too many questions. I, I believe in showing, giving more justice to them than to be myself, even if at uh, my own cost. So uh, thank you, Ming Feng Tang. His question is, uh, my question is about the current stuck neck problems, which Chinese semiconductor manufacturing firms are facing. The US government imposed sanctions on the high tech parts purchases of Chinese firms from their trade partners in the US. Would you please give some suggestion how Chinese firms can catch up in the semiconductor industry? Because yeah, they, are, yeah. they are getting constrained because yeah, of yeah. it. Yeah, exactly in the last chapter of the book, mm -hmm. China's Reform Catching, I uh, devoted some section on this prospect of uh, China. So US sanction 
or reaction to rise China has, uh, of course, will have an impact on China's uh, uh, upgrading. And they need the upgrading to move beyond middle income, join high income status. And usually upgrading requires access to foreign technology, access to foreign market also, upgrading in terms of sending low end segment abroad, keeping high end segment at home, this is globalization. And these two upgrading will be uh, interrupted in China's context due to this US reaction. But that also means China might be forced to seek their own path, their own trajectory, learning less on Western technology. So China is pushed to explore leapfrogging in the sense, so in the short term, China's catching up uh, upgrading might be delayed, but given China's scale and the strong in basic sciences, China might be able, to, China might fail, but China might be able to find a way to growth relying on their own technology, different trajectory from incumbent countries. If China succeeds, uh, that's a big uh, event in world history because China achieving something which uh, never achieved by any other country in the so far. In other words, uh, well, that's very risky. So we'll see uh, what will be the uh, future of China. And in semiconductor too, although they're getting difficult access to EUB, the, the Dutch ASML company, the very important uh, machine making semiconductor, but they can find a different way of uh, making chip, not using this EUB, but other machine, other generation. It's happening. For example, the microelectronics US said that they developed the uh, uh, high tech uh, next generation chip, not using EUB, but old generation DUB. So that means there might be different pathways, trajectory of technology called development for China. So. Uh, uh, in theoretical term, I would say uh, it's not impossible, but it requires much more coordinated effort for Chinese context. We'll see whether, uh, but I, when I talk to my Chinese scholars, they say that they are seems to be optimistic about this prospect. We'll see. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, so there is that. Uh, another, I have actually more questions from my side. I think uh, our, uh, our, our, highly proactive audience. They are not permitting me to uh, kind of uh, take my questions. So I do more justice to them. Same person, there's another question. Given the three conspicuous challenges we are facing now, these challenges are the radical changes of society under the digital economy, the arduous economic recovery in the post pandemic era, and the precarious risk associated with the globalization. Very interesting, three risks which we are confronted with. First is uh, the digital economy, the change in society under digital economy. Second is the arduous economic, the plausible difficulty in coming out of the, the, the post pandemic era. Then the precarious risk associated with the globalization. How can Asian countries make adjustment on the innovation or technology innovation catch up path. How in this new environment of, these are actually three pronged, a, a triangle of three issues, you know, they are in that context, how, you know, to innovation to kind of help developing uh, Asian countries. This is one question. Next question will come after answering this all. I can, uh, this another <laughs> question. same order, the same person is asking. Closer regional cooperation such as RC, RECP, Regional Economic Cooperation Partnership, or gradually decoupled industrial chain cooperation. How we reposition <coughs> our comparative advantages as Asian countries to form appropriate innovation strategies. I mean, this is the kind of the relevance of regional economic cooperation and how do we position ourselves in the Asian context, Asian countries uh, in the with our innovation strategies in the change in context? He's continuing with the question. There is also an argument that Asian century will be a competition between land power based and sea power based countries. 
and how should asian countries or countries around asean make their own national innovation strategy for catch up plans uh, i think heavily loaded three sets of questions <laughs> regional okay. economic cooperation the current three challenges within that how what is the way to dig around out of that harding mm -hmm. singh innovation and i mean that's good that's the all important two or three question and mm -hmm. uh, the key word connecting this will be like uh, i mentioned digitalization and globalization or deglobalization and uh, uh, covid impact of gvc uh, reshaping so if you combine this keyword we see uh, we see big change happening in uh, global value chain gvc in asia and around the world and one put, one important thing is that um, kind of many companies are doing reshoring and neoshoring for example many korean companies are exiting from china because us tariff imposed on china export and china is wage rate getting higher and higher and china company very strong they are driving foreign company out of competition and so on so for example samsung already moved all their final good assembly factory out of china no samsung assembly factory in television tv or refrigerator or uh, 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 the washing machine. They're all now based in Vietnam or other Asian countries or back home as a reshoring. They keep only three. One is the um, memory chips, battery, memory chips, electric batteries, MLCs, which is the component for uh, circuit board. So other than this intermediate part, Samsung moved all the assembly factory out of China, either back home reshoring or nearshoring into Vietnam or Southeastern countries. In that regard, Southeastern countries are facing new windows of opportunity mm -hmm. of receiving new ways of wave of in FDI from uh, uh, countries around the world, Korea, Japan, US, and so on. So it's up to them how to utilize this as a stepping stone to upgrade. But now they have to upgrade they have to combine did this not, not only traditional uh, chip labor, but also with the uh, high skilled, upskilled labor and also digital technology. So then uh, uh, there might be a, a new waves of uh, uh, catching up for uh, 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 neighboring Asian countries. Okay. Yeah, I think that's remarkable. I think you are, you are still the framework of your approach of uh, uh, still over there a window of opportunity. You know, window of opportunity. If you're vigilant, if you're watchful, there is nothing to regret. I think this is a this is actually a a, a person with enormous optimism and positive approach to life. I think I can see that. And also, this is a message that uh, our young scholars should take very very seriously. At any moment of time, if there's a challenge, there will definitely be an opportunity. The challenge is really to see the opportunity over there, the window of opportunity over there, wonderful. I must, I must, I appreciate that. But then the question which uh, I'm sure later, uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, Asian transformation, and particularly in a kind of discourse like this, uh, we cannot uh, uh, discard uh, the current uh, global uh, concerns. Uh, in terms of sustainability, you know, sustainability in the sense of uh, increasing inequality, and uh, the sustainability has got a socio-economic and ecological dimension. You know, when you're talking about uh, ecological dimensions, we have Professor John Matthews and others. You know, they have they have done enormous amount of work, and they, I'm sure they will be enlightening us. And uh, in 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 when you are talking about um, uh, the catch up, particularly when you are talking about the countries which are lagging behind and they are still the, still the victims of the de deindustrialization and they are also the victims of increasing, they are also, there are countries which are trying to build up international competitiveness, which are immiserizing competitiveness. You can build competitiveness through innovation-driven competitiveness. 
other is through cost cutting competitiveness that cost cutting is done by reduced wages poor quality of labor poor quality of employment and ultimately you are leading to a situation wherein the workers are paid much less and your competitiveness i would call it call it as immiserizing and poverty aggravating and inequality aggravating competitiveness building under globalization so what will be your take kj uh, mm. maybe we finishing up this first part yeah then uh, okay. joining me to the right. panelists right. and okay. broaden okay. our discussion okay now coming to the when you are talking about uh, the, the 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 catch up episode and also uh, uh, from your research what do you find then the future the future uh, 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 research particularly from your own research agenda on the basis oh, of what oh, you have oh, been done okay. and secondly yeah. what do you like to advise to the younger generation you know that okay so let's make them as a last question before we uh, taking break so my recent research agenda is uh, Uh, going down to level of regions or sub national unit or cities big cities mm. so i'm going down from level of nation to yeah. regional inven system or ris mm. that's my most current research so i have done case study of shenzhen penang taipei comparing how shenzhen is much faster catching up than penang although penang is old history of attracting mnc's then i spend the same framework to Uh, global data of uh, around 33 cities around the world using same measurement I did for national level. So uh, because I thought the national level sometimes too big because in each nation there are different cities with different heterogeneity. So I found that I needed to do analysis not only nation but not only form but also the region. Mm -hmm. So that's my Current research, so I'm presenting my uh, RIS analysis uh, on Sunday in Skalix uh, meetings and other meetings. Okay, then uh, uh, for young scholars, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, uh, growth as a scholar, you got to utilize several or create your own windows opportunity, and they are not that difficult. They are. attending globalist conference and sympathetic conference many other companies there you should meet people and find your courses colleagues and your mentors groups without just interaction uh, you'll be isolated you'll remain alone then your productivity as scholar will be less than otherwise <laughs> so please interact with others uh, yeah young and horizontally and vertically and so on. And that's more important uh, advice I'd like to give to young scholars because that's why I, how I grow up as scholars. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just listening to what others are doing their research, even that just give an idea how to I not redirect my direction of research uh, in, in the futures. And, who I should meet, which reading, which article I should read. And uh, those uh, offline online conference is a uh, time-saving way for you to uh, be productive in uh, research and to find a new insight. Yeah. <laughs> What are the opportunities that you would like to uh, kind of uh, propose from the Shumbitirian Society and Globalix by keeping Shumbitirian Society and Globalix these two networks you have been yeah. very very active yeah and uh, these are uh, networks that are a lot of common members and uh, we have got asia leaks yeah, and yeah, yeah, uh, i would yeah. like to know what is your uh, advice for global leaks as a network asia leaks as a regional networks and shumbitian society and as an influential scholar and an experienced scholar what do you kind of what are the kind of future trajectory for these uh, these uh, research networks and scholar networks <coughs> well i mean the i mean the, all those uh, network and uh, places are important and uh, if you go to sympathetic and you will get more uh, interesting with advanced countries scholars global leaks 
and uh, regional leagues like uh, Asian leagues or La leagues, and so they are meeting from different regions, and they are all complementary. Okay, so uh, uh, in the future maybe this conference should be uh, allowing more opportunity for young scholars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, uh, our senior scholars' uh, obligation, our duties. Okay. Okay. We have some questions on the floor. We can perhaps take it for or any. Uh... You omit. We have many more questions from the floor coming in. I'm trying to locate. Uh, this is. Um... So KJ, we have to take a break and. Uh, we have to take a break. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's okay. take okay. five minutes break now. Yeah. Yeah, okay, let's take a break now. I think we will uh, get back with our panelists after five minutes plus. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, thank you because uh, I think uh, it was uh, really enlightening and we'll continue after five minutes. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> you are mute, unmute. <laughs> Hi, how are you? <laughs> how are you? So, I'm uh, uh, do, we, do we still have our program tomorrow? Tomorrow, yes, two o'clock. What? Uh, two o'clock your time. At two o'clock. Or, or, or do you want to make we, it day after? Do you want to make it day after? Because tomorrow. Uh, how is your? How, I okay. Was okay. Well, uh, to, tomorrow, uh, the day after is the twenty-six. Is it? I don't know. You can Tomorrow do it. 25. 25. Tomorrow is 25. Should we make it 26? 26th. Yes. Okay. Two o'clock. Two o'clock your time. Our time. That's right. That's Wonderful. Right. So should I prepare a PowerPoint? Ah, why not? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> you are a person with a lot of power, so naturally. Hi. Yes. Orge, how yeah. are you? <laughs> yeah. How are you doing, Mamo? Nice how are hearing you. you. I don't Lovely see you, but see you. nice hearing yeah, you. See, so point. nice to see you. Yes. So wonderful to see you. Okay, let me uh, just. For a long time. Okay, uh, long time, you? Mamo. Long time, long time. That's right. Uh, this COVID nineteen. Uh, we just. Where, where are you now? I'm. I'm. I'm I lost I'm, track. I'm in Pretoria, South Africa. I see. I see. I'm in South Africa. How so. are you? Okay. You are good. Yeah. Yes. Everything. Yes. Coming up. I mean, yes. uh, I had a difficult year uh, health-wise, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting much better now. Okay. Yes. Extremely happy to see you. Very happy to see you after a long yes. time. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. So nice. So uh, It's so nice to see Latin America, Asia, Africa. All of us are together <laughs> with technology. <laughs> we hey, see Mambo, you, you're still very active. Huh? Oh, uh, yeah, my <laughs> lovely to see you. <laughs> but I, I sometimes see you in the in the messenger. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. But we 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 need you to do something. Can you do? Uh, can we join do something together? <laughs> oh, of course, of course. We, we should do some joint research. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to change innovation. <laughs> so how yeah. hey, do you travel a lot or you stop traveling uh, now i don't travel a lot but uh, so, but yeah. uh, on but not, my my children are in london so i need i need to go to london again yeah yeah and usually now i go to ethiopia or but uh, you should have invited me to come to japan <laughs> yeah, of course, definitely. And Jorge, do, do you travel a lot? You have health no, problems? Not really. For the last two years uh, during the pandemic, I haven't done any traveling at all. And mm -hmm. this is my first out from Chile. I'm speaking as from Brazil today uh, mm -hmm. because I, I decided to take a break and a holiday. Uh, Chile is very cold, very, very cold. And I it's came. Very cold. Oh, okay. Mm. I came back. I came uh, out to. He's the beach Chile. in Bahia in north northern Brazil. Good the friend. next 10 days I will be here Very and then nice. I go back to Chile. But I'm not doing any traveling at all because uh, I had a tough year, as I mentioned before, 
uh, mm. health-wise, and I had to undergo an immunochemistry, and uh, it's now very well, and I finished the treatment, and uh, over mm. that period, I didn't do any traveling at all. I see, I see. So, uh, I'm glad that you are healthier. Yeah. It's it's really good. I mean, I only finished the treatment about three months ago, and I feel quite uh, confident that uh, I'm I'm getting back to to some sort of a internal equilibrium as far as health is concerned. I see. I see. Yeah. Well, we are getting older, particularly myself. Mm -hmm. How 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 old are you, if I may ask? Went 82. Well, 82. Wow. Oh, I see. <laughs> but you're still active. <laughs> very active. Still, yeah. But I was I was very impressed by Keun's uh, uh, words about how to deal with the next generation and how he encouraged them to look out for mentors and try to ask their own questions because uh, the questions we framed in the 80s and 90s. I have been strongly distorted by the, the events of the last decade, particularly the pandemic. And mm -hmm. in, in, in this sense, I think we are heading towards a very different world uh, structure. And I, I was quite happy to hear Keun speaking about China uh, needing to uh, develop its own path uh, out of uh, uh, North American restrictions on trade and, and, and uh, technological development. Mm. Very nice. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's about uh, one more minute to go for the break, but in between, uh, there's an announcement for the next event. So for the In Conversation series, the ninth event we are going to have on 9th of September, and uh, with Professor John Pears, he's very much here with us and I really wish him a very good health uh, in the years to come. And, uh, and uh, for the conversation part, we are going to have him uh, with us and try to understand his uh, growth over the years. So please uh, join us uh, next time uh, in the next episode. And the more uh, we would be sending more information uh, regarding the event uh, to our emails later in the program, uh, 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 later in a few days rather. So please uh, join us on 9 September 2022 also. Uh, we have uh, I think it's it's about uh, about time. It's uh, five minutes are getting over. So, uh, is Professor KJ here? I'm very much here. Yes. 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 Uh, I think uh, we should. Uh, yeah, Professor Kinley is also back. So uh, the second part, kindly, uh, please. Second part of it. Yes. Yeah. Welcome back, friends. I think. Um, I found it was really uh, exciting and illuminating uh, to have uh, nearly an hour with Professor Kunli. I think even a month I could spend, spend with him like this. But unfortunately, well, most of us are economists and we all work with constraint. Eh? So unfortunately we have the constraint. But then I have with an eminent panel. I don't, I don't know how, who put this panel together. These three more people who are joining us in their own individual capacity. They have added so much to our understanding of the Asian dynamics from different perspectives. Working in different countries in Asia and beyond. So we have with me, Professor John Matthews, Professor Emeritus at McQuay University, Sydney. He's in the Faculty of Business Economics. For the last uh, 20 years, he was uh, at the same university, the Graduate School of Management. And from 2019 to 2012, he held concurrently any chair of competitive dynamics and the global strategy at Luis Gardo Carli, that's in, in Rome. For the past several years, Professor Matthews has focused on greening the industry in an with an emphasis on the role of China. 
I think here is a professor with innovation and true innovation forecasting perspective. He was much ahead of many of us in terms of thinking about the relevance of greening the economy and particularly realizing the fact that the so-called sustainability issue and the whole so-called global warming, the so-called environmental pollution, the so-called human beings' greediness. While we have, as Mahatma Gandhi said, we have enough for the need, but not for the greed. And he has anticipated it and he has been looking in terms of, he has worked for addressing this issue, bringing the nexus between ecology, economy, and technology. Professor John Matthews, had, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to you. And we have, uh, I would like, I also we have got uh, Professor Patrapong. Patrapong is, uh, I would say that I must acknowledge that it is through Patrapong I came across Globalix. I came to know about Globalix. During when I was a UNSCAF consultant, uh, I was in Patrapong's office and uh, you know, we became friendly in half an hour. In three months time, two months time, we decided to write a paper together on India, China, India, Thailand comparison and be presented in the next Globalix conference. A remarkable friend, a wonderful scholar and true innovation scholar of Asia and uh, his articulation in terms of, particularly for Asian less developed countries to transition, the relevance of transitioning, transitioning from investment-driven growth to innovation-driven growth. You know that we have been told that you attract FDI, you are saving is less, in, you raise your investment rate, whatever you still borrow, whatever, no, but here is Professor Patrapong, very strongly articulated, working with the ministry over there, science and technology ministry over there, now he is with the groups, and he is a fellow of the CIFAR Canada, like our Professor Kunli, and founding director of the Center for Economic Catch-up. Now, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> yeah, but Patrapong is a full professor at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, GRIPS in Tokyo. His research interests include innovation system in the newly industrialized countries. I think he's first. I think he's first person to write about a developing country innovation system with focus on Asia in research policy. And uh, his, uh, I mean, industrial clusters, technological capabilities of latecomer firms, innovation financing and roles of public research institutes and universities. So his area of concern about innovation by touching upon each and every key pillars of innovation system. There is hardly any pillar of innovation system left by Professor, uh, uh, Professor Patrang Pong. He is an editor-in-chief of uh, SSI Index to Asian Journal of Technology and Innovation and a member of international editorial boards of a number of uh, innovation-related journals. He has worked uh, as an advisor, consultant to World Bank, UNESCO, UNCTAD, OECD, JICA, and many others. Welcome, and uh, we are going to benefit from uh, Professor uh, Patrapong. Now, the third person in the panel is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, Jason, Jason Lim. He is uh, basically from Korea and uh, technology innovation management professor for the last 22 years. And that too, like Professor Kyun Lee, working on Korea and the unique experience of Korea and the kind of experience and expertise and insight that he has given and gathered is incredible. And uh, after working for Korea's premier economic research institute for 10 years, uh, research, his work, research work has been focused on technological catch-up, innovation management by emerging firms and founded Korea Industry for Association, Industry for Association in 2015. And he became a member of the Boston-based Industrial Internet Consortium with active collaboration with the peers on test birds and business related subjects such as digital transformation. I think Professor Chasing is actually a professor of 22nd century, not even 21st. He's ahead of all of us in terms of looking at and, and analyzing the frontier issues like industry for and related issues. 
And I can go on introducing these eminent scholars that since again, we are, I'm, I'm constrained by time. So my, I would suggest is that instead of uh, questioning Professor uh, Curley, these panelists with enormous competence by themselves in this specific area, they would, I would like you to take maybe about five to 10 minutes in terms of you are on take in a specific area. So for example, on greening the economy, low carbon innovation, and uh, sustainable orient, sustainability oriented innovation system. These are all important themes of much current relevance, which I'm sure Professor Matthews is going to enlighten us. I'm sorry, Professor Matthews, asking you to do the impossible within another five to eight minutes. And you do that and put on the base of that, ask Professor, uh, uh, please raise some questions to supplement because you, we, we are all co-authors of, uh, we all worked with Kunli, we know him. So I open the floor first to Professor John Matthews. Over to you, Professor John Matthews. You are, could you please unmute your mic, please, sir? Professor, yeah, yeah. Please unmute your mic. Yeah, good. Okay. Now, now I think you can hear me. Yeah. Very good. Very so it's uh, it's it's a great pleasure to be part of this panel uh, and to interact directly with uh, these eminent scholars who are part of the panel uh, and with Kun Lee. And he reminds me that we actually met at the World Bank. I was giving a talk there uh, at the invitation of Sanjay Lal, and uh, he and I met back in the year 2006, and we've been uh, following each other's work uh, ever since, and I'd like to uh, congratulate him on this uh, wonderful new book on China. I don't know whether you can see it. I've been reading it uh, uh, today on China's technological leapfrogging and economic catch-up, uh, and you've uh, so clearly uh, put the, the three forms of, uh, of catch up. Uh, there's the form where the companies and the countries are path following, that is the traditional style of catch up, path following, uh, or they're skipping a stage, uh, or they're developing uh, their own pathway, uh, which uh, uh, their own pathway where it, it's a kind of leapfrogging. So the, this, I think, is so clearly put by you in, in your book on China. You're discussing to what extent China is following uh, these strategies. But um, my sense is that here we have a wonderful way to uh, discuss this inevitable greening of the development process. It's worth saying that first Japan, then Korea, then Taiwan, Singapore, now China, all of these countries in Asia, all following a successful catch-up strategy, all utilised fossil fuels. Every single one of them were utilising fossil fuels. And my sense is, uh, and I'd really like to pose this as a question to, uh, to Professor Kian Lee, is, is it possible for uh, developing countries in, say, Africa, like Ethiopia, or countries uh, in South America, like Brazil or Chile, is it possible for them to successfully move uh, Professor John Matthew, you your 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 voice is not audible. You are not audible. You are not audible. Sorry, now you can hear me. I'm sorry about that. So my question to Professor Kun Lee is using this triple framework of looking at just path following or looking at skipping a stage or looking at uh, leapfrogging, how can you see uh, op prospects for the countries that are going to be industrializing in the rest of this century? Countries in Africa, like Ethiopia, countries in South America, like Brazil, or like uh, Chile, 
countries in South Asia, where are they going to be able to green their industrial strategy, move off the fossil fuels uh, pathway, and to what extent will they be able to use the, the, the catch-up framework, but do so with a different foundation for their energy strategies? That would be my question to you, Professor Lee. Thank you, uh, John. So I know this is your, your most important uh, uh, topics and uh, 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 the issues. And um, I think we can still apply this uh, framework of uh, catching up, in particular the leapfrogging uh, framework to context of uh, Africa or other emerging economies. Basically, uh, the essence of uh, catch up theory is that uh, I call it catch up paradox. That means you cannot catch up if you just keep catching up. Okay. <laughs> that means if, uh, the, the, if you're just imitating incumbent, you will never uh, uh, overtake or surpass the incumbent. You have to do something different. You start from learning from foreigners incumbent, but to go beyond that, you have to do something different. So in that sense, uh, uh, late commerce, uh, just doing slow catching up, which means best following. But if you are more ambitious, trying to do some more fast catching up, you have to do, try something different for incumbent. Otherwise, you're always behind your foreigners. Okay? So uh, in the regard, um, uh, uh, regarding choice of your industrial structures, black or green or choice of your energy uh, industries. Uh, whatever opportunities arise, you have to grab them and to do uh, something different ahead of incumbent and then you can uh, find a different trajectory, which are uh, more uh, environment friendly and so on. So because uh, in terms of global scale, if you latecomers all do the same pass of uh, Coastal fail, uh, fuel based growth for us will be disaster, we'll be facing uh, environmental disaster. So, in the sense, uh, uh, it's better to find a different trajectory. But uh, the issue is the cost or your own technical capability. So, um, otherwise, many latecomers cannot afford to switch to new. Uh, 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 non fossil fuel uh, fuel based growth is a matter of uh, cost. If you don't have your own technology, you have to buy, you have to borrow from others, and that uh, requires cost. So, uh, low income latecomers or low middle latecomers, although it is logically uh, possible or necessary for to take a different path or leapfrogging, uh, their choice is not that much uh, 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 easy. So they're facing uh, some challenges uh, in terms of how to handle this uh, uh, new new way of growth or green growth, whatever you call it. Okay, so, but if you go to like upper middle countries or large countries like uh, China and uh, Brazil, they have a much better prospect. They have already uh, capable in terms of level of technology or resources. So in this economy, they are. Uh, Really, I'm the, uh, I'm the uh, uh, going forward ahead to take a leaf growing strategy to adopt different technical trajectory. Then that's the only way you can achieve some uh, growth beyond your current statuses. So, uh, if your main question is possibility, I would say it's possible, but depending upon uh, each country's uh, context you are facing different trade-offs or, or challenges. But I know you might, you might have a better advice <laughs> than me. <laughs> okay. John, I cannot hear you. Um, I, I'd like to hear from my fellow panelists. So. Thank you for giving me the floor, and uh, I'd like to move on to Chai Sung and to Patarapo. Patarapo, you go first. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, it's my great opportunity to uh, have direct conversation with Professor Kun Lee, whom I know for 20 years. I think we attended the Global X uh, conference together in many events starting from Beijing. And I, I could not remember whether you will attend the Rio de Janeiro one, the first one. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't. <laughs> oh, you didn't, right? So you are a late comer. I'm a more for <laughs> in that sense. Okay, I, I want to ask you about uh, your capacity as a policy advisor, because so far we talk about your role as a serious researcher, but for the role of policy advisor that you have uh, official capacity as the vice chair of National Economic Advisory Council for the president of Korea, I, I want to know how can you make sure that your ideas and recommendation on innovation will be actually implemented? And how can you convince the governments and president whose ideology and main policy are different from yours to accept your idea and recommendation? I remember one time you said that you didn't believe in the last government like uh, uh, President Moon Jae in increase of the minimum wage, but you still be his advisor. Right? <laughs> so his main policy is, is different from your idea, but how can you make sure you work with them? And how can you make sure that your recommendation has been uh, properly delivered and implemented? Thank you. So uh, given my listening experience, just, uh, the last uh, Last year of this previous government, I served as uh, the vice chairman for the National Economic Advisory Council, which is the main the, uh, kind of advisory body to the president. Presidency chair, I was a uh, vice chair. Okay, but uh, uh, this is only advisory. We are not that much powerful <laughs> executive body like ministry. So uh, the president office, president has many channels of listening to uh, opinion from diverse spectrum of society. Of course, he's on the uh, ministries and he has several the, like this uh, committee from different subject. And uh, uh, so uh, he is listening to different voices and uh, they try to uh, uh, come up with final uh, decision making based on uh, the diverse view. So, we are one of the key main body in that regard, but uh, we are just one of them. So then the most frustration is that uh, every decision making by top leaders is uh, politically constrained. So they consider not only economic uh, nationality efficiency, but also other political impact, political uh, implications. And that part is very tricky and beyond our <laughs> uh, scope. So minimum wages um, is natural. Every year uh, we are we have been increasing minimum wage like five percent, seven percent, so on. That's natural, no objection. But just one year in 2018, uh, 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 it, it was increased by sixteen percent, sixteen percent, just one year. It's a kind of sharp. So uh, that's why uh, I and many economists oppose. But it was. Three years before me become vice chair, so I'm not responsible for, for that part. So that's the beginning year of the, this previous government. I served with the chair uh, the last uh, years of his term. It was only kind of a wrapping up period, but in that period we come up with important Polish initiative called uh, Kane New Deal. Okay, New Deal is uh, three aspects at the time: the um, Green New Deal, a new safety net New Deal and digital new deal. So this was to uh, bring up Korea, come up with a uh, new paradigm uh, uh, shifting to our uh, economic policy line to adapting to the changing environment of digitalization and the greening and importance of data and so on. So uh, this idea of a new deal was, uh, 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 we, we uh, my organization was one of the source for those uh, ideas, suggesting we need a new Polish paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. 
But as you mentioned, we are just advisory, so I don't take any responsibility for the execution part. <laughs> but it was very good experience. I learned how policies are formulated, how they are going through several layers of check and balance. It takes time and uh, your whatever original ideas always being uh, modified and qualified, then at the end, uh, you look it look quite different from your original propositions sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you very much. So uh, we have uh, the third panelist, uh, Shei Sung Lin. I suggest that Professor Ch uh, Lin, uh, since uh, you bring uh, so much of experience about Korean Korea and the industrial, the, the technological uh, uh, transformation. Uh, for us in Asia, you know, Asia is, uh, sorry, South Korea is Asia's pride and foreigners envy. So I would, uh, I would like you to uh, briefly highlight the Asian, the Korean uh, uh, remarkable catch up and post question to Professor Curley. Uh, well, um, thank you. Um, when uh, uh, we had a work, uh, Kun and I had a work on uh, catching up in 2001 for research policy. Uh, we had a uh, set uh, for catching up with the, with the confidence. And uh, I think, is there any problem? Uh, facing a, some problem a, with it. a big challenge, uh, discontinuous challenge like uh, pandemic and the supply chain disruption and data transformation, which is quite strange. And so my question to Kun uh, would be, I mean, you asked me about uh, the story of uh, Korea, but I think I'm worried about the time. So I just uh, jump on to the question. The question would be in this kind of discontinuous change, uh, what, what kind of consideration would be for, uh, as a, I mean, you have been talking about success factors uh, of Korean uh, uh, innovation model. And then what would be the, 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 the implication of this model in this kind of discontinuous change. So then perhaps the, there would be some successful factors which would be still uh, useful, but there would be also limits uh, of a Korean model. So then you would have a lot of thoughts about it. So this is my question. So what would be the uh, the implication of success factors and the limitation of Korean innovation model? That would be the question. Okay, thank you. So, um, because we already talked about the, the strengths part of the East Asian or Korean model, if I turn to uh, the weakness or risky side of uh, Korean model of, uh, catching up, uh, there are several things. First of all, we are too much the big business Dominant, in other words, still uh, Kaprobu Jebel or family conglomerate are quite dominant in Korean uh, as innovation uh, players. So uh, we have to promote more innovation from uh, newcomers or startups, SME. Uh, that's the big challenges. Okay. So uh, all government policy is trying to uh, uh, boost that those new source of innovation. We are making some success, but maybe we can do uh, uh, better, okay? Also, maybe this is John's topics. Uh, the new paradigm is emerging in manufacturing. There is the, uh, the uh, carbon-free, uh, carbon-less paradigm. And that technology, Korea is, I think, somewhat lagging behind compared to European uh, companies. So. Uh, we have promised to reduce the, our uh, uh, CO2 emission certain uh, uh, standard and range. That's very challenging, very uh, uh, formidable I mean, the, uh, target. So 
it requires a big radical change our in the structures. I'm not sure how much, how can we can really realize that uh, declared goal. So that requires uh, new types of technology and that's the bigger challenge facing uh, Korean industry oriented manufacturing. On the other hand, uh, uh, our another risky side is that between US and China, for China is our biggest market. For US is our biggest source of technology. So we are torn between this uh, technology versus market. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, further now, uh, US is uh, kind of reacting to rise of, US is, US is holding back, holding back too much fast rise of China's industry. And that's serving as kind of a uh, room for Korea to be uh, remain as a big player in manufacturing. Because if you Western country don't turn to China, the remaining option is only uh, Korea or uh, Asia and so. so in that regard, uh, current situation has uh, many implications, and uh, Korean manufacturing companies are meeting some new uh, 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 rising market or demand or value of, of them in international uh, uh, supply of uh, manufactured goods. On the other hand, uh, as US getting more aggressive in terms of their action toward China, we are facing dilemmas how to deal with the China market, because even US saying that if you get a uh, subsidy from US uh, uh, government, you cannot expand your facility in China and so on. And uh, that's out of uh, international standards, and, uh, but US is pushing that. So in that regard, we are facing uh, difficult choices. Mm. On the other hand, progressive side is that as many, we are making a nice transition from short cycle based sectors to long cycle based sectors. Long cycle means that bio, biomedicine, and so on. That part is going very well because of a uh, pandemic serving as a windows opportunity. As I mentioned, bio sector is uh, high entry barriers, but because of emergency of pandemic, entry barriers become low. Many Western companies are giving, trying to buy from Korean product. So uh, Korea's progress into long cycle sectors is uh, doing very, very well. So, out of the top 10 big business chambers, out of them, eight of them investing in heavily in bio sectors. Before they thought that our bio is very difficult, very challenging, they're afraid of bio sectors. But now they're all eagerly moving into bio sectors, seeing that opportunity profitable. Okay. On the other hand, if you count top 10 company in Korean stock market, before it all used to be either IT or automobile or steel. But now we have uh, three bio company and two digital platform company. So then in that sense, Korea industry become more diversified, not only just short cycle orientation, but also long cycle, also digital platform companies are among the top 10. So in that regard, we are making some uh, interesting transition of uh, uh, leading sectors that from away from short cycle, more diversified into long cycle and the digital. That's a good, good part. That's my overview of what's going on in uh, Korean industries. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, we will go for a few, I mean, if the panels uh, have no other questions, I will go to, I will pick up the questions which came from the floor. Is it okay? Swati, what is your advice? Uh, yes, uh, I, I think we could just extend uh, uh, maximum by half an hour if if uh, uh, if it's okay for for everyone. Yeah, and let us also yeah, half an hour is okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. What I will do is we'll pick up uh, some of the questions that came from the floor. Now that's important. Uh, so this is from uh, Chandrasekhar. Dr. Chandrasekhar asks innovation and development. Uh, require interaction between academia and research, the industry and government. Application of emerging technologies to real life problem solving and the product or process development needs cross fertilization resulting from intense interaction between academia, academic disciplines and industries and local entrepreneurs. 
Professor Kurli, could you please elaborate more on the place of China in promoting university, industry, and government linkages in comparison with uh, other Asian countries like India? I know that we had a project. I think uh, this is a right question on the industry academia interface, and we are taking the agenda from the triple helix. So focus more on China and other countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Yes. Thank so, you, Jim. Yeah, that's a good question. When I look at China from this NIS perspective, uh, one uh, interesting aspect of China NIS is that very active role by the university academia compared to uh, smaller Asian economies, right? So uh, China universities are uh, very active in utilizing their research into commercial venturing and generating many uh, spin off And also uh, this happened not only to uh, university, but also uh, many academia called uh, government research think tank called Chinese Academy of Sciences, they are almost like a big conglomerate. They have so many uh, uh, subsidiary company under them. They all spin off from this uh, Academy of Sciences. And uh, many Chinese uh, high-tech companies are uh, one of them. They are the spin off from university or it's a think tank, okay? So in the regard, uh, Chinese university is an important source of knowledge and growth for China's industrial strengths. And, uh, 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 and uh, when I said China can seek, explore different trajectory or paths, of course, university is the uh, source of uh, making China explore that path. Because I, in my book, I have data on the table showing that how much scientific articles are written by authors from China versus US. I have data for IT by its own. In early 2000, 2000, like 2003, China was half of US. 2008, China gets similar to US level, but nowadays China has two times more scientific articles than US authors. And they're also achieving a lot in top 10 highly cited article, Chinese authors are almost same weight as US authors. So that means academia, universities are important source of scientific and technical knowledge, which can be a basis for China to explore different paths from uh, US. So we'll see yeah, yeah, yeah. whether China, will, how much China will make success. Okay. Uh, I understand that Professor Orge Kartz would like to raise some questions, and I think his question will be to all the panelists. Professor Orge, how are you? Hello? Professor Kartz, are you? Hello? I think uh, Jorge has just left, uh, maybe a technical glitch. He might oh. join back. Until then, let's continue. Let's continue. Okay, okay. Here is a question which uh, comes, is industrialization, I think uh, this question could be answered by Professor John Matthews perhaps, is industrialization or urbanization an inevitable way to technology innovation catch up uh, with the green sustainable concern? A book recently, I don't think that that's it's giving some examples. Uh, a book recently read by uh, Shugi Du. This is the person who is asking the question. Thank you for the question. The recent question, book which they, uh, they read, it's uh, that offered rich insights about this problem. Agrarian change and urbanization in South India, City and the Present by Seema Purishottaman. So the question uh, perhaps uh, uh, Professor John Matthews could address this. Is industrialization or urbanization an inevitable way to technology or innovation catch up with green sustainable concern? Can we have without that's yeah. Could you please unmute your mic, sir? Sure. And mic is again mode. Okay. Can you can you hear me now? Yeah. Very that's good. okay. Good. Very okay. Good. Well, Clearly, the 
issue of uh, to what extent an economy is becoming green and the extent to which an economy is industrializing, these are inextricably linked questions. And that's what I've been addressing in my own work, just mm. to what extent we have to change the paradigm of talking about industrial development so that we can incorporate uh, the ideas of greening and provide a, a new and sustainable basis for countries that are industrializing. So I was very struck, for example, on my recent visit to Ethiopia in Africa. And here's a, a country that is working very closely with China. It's uh, developing uh, uh, an access to, uh, to maritime trade uh, through having a railway that was built with the cooperation of, uh, of China. But at the same time, I was struck that uh, Ethiopia is building. Your mic got muted again. Mike, could you please unmute your mic again? This up. Yeah. Is this better now? Good. Yeah. Very good. No? Very good. Very good. No, again, muted. No. Yeah. So good. now you can hear me. Good. You can hear. So you can hear. In these industrial parks I found in Ethiopia, they're using the most advanced technologies for recycling materials. And they're gaining a competitive advantage for their exports mm -hmm. by doing so. So here's a case where they're path following, they're following a traditional pathway of industrialization, looking at textiles, looking at clothing, but they're utilizing the most advanced methods of recycling materials and reducing their, uh, re reducing their waste. And so my question to Professor Lee is in this triple that you've uh, very loved, beautifully elaborated in your most recent book on China, where countries can either follow the existing pathway or they can skip stages or they can leapfrog. Maybe there's a way of discussing this that looks at their overall strategy for choice of industry, but then looks at how they implement that strategy by uh, utilizing some of the insights of green development and moving off the hegemony of fossil fuels. I don't know whether you've thought about that, Kuhn, or whether you might have anything to remark on that point. So I, I have a question before okay. answering another. In the case of Ethiopia, they adopting this uh, uh, new technology. Is it from their FDI partners or how they got acquired that technology? Is it from foreign partners or how they did it in the new studio or so on? No, it's from, it's from foreign partners. Uh -huh. um, and these, uh, these industrial parks are open to those kinds of collaborations. So uh -huh. the, the role that the Ethiopians played was to find the best source of technology, but then to implement it. So they were doing it through their state structure. The, the management of these industrial parks is in the hands of the central government. It's a state agency that manages them. So I think that's good phenomena. It's not surprising that uh, uh, the FDI companies, when they develop uh, new factories or green investment, they're not just adopting old technology, but they're adopting uh, new technology, which is more environmentally friendly or, or, or sustainable. So that's what I'm saying, that like the, the new wave of investment are coming into South Asia and uh, Korea, Japan investing, and uh, they're building new factory, which is much different uh, 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 vintage or technology from the old factories, they're all digitally based and so on. So, but it's uh, from Lake Park, it's just adoption of new technology. So I'm not, the issue is how much they can internalize those technology into their own uh, 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 innovation system. That's uh, uh, separate issues. That's a challenge. 
how to make innovation leading to their own mm -hmm. in, indigenous innovation. That's the issue facing countries like Ethiopia and uh, some uh, uh, late common countries. Yes. Okay. Uh, but the, the, the okay. question was about urbanization. I think urbanization might not be necessary because if you adopt more digital infrastructure and so on, it, it, you don't have to live in urban areas. You can live in the outskirts, the rural areas. You can still more benefit from digital uh, infrastructures. So urbanization might become less mandatory, less necessary in this new world of digitalization and so on. Yeah. yeah. Professor Chasen Alim, I think I'm very excited to see your uh, active involvement in Industry 4, Industry 4.0, and uh, the related research. And uh, uh, are we uh, at this juncture, it's quite natural for Asians uh, to have a concern in terms of, you know, we have recently uh, are having findings, uh, including from Bendake Lundwal and others uh, saying that this digital monopolies are emerging as more powerful than ever before. The monopoly power of the digital monopolies is in fact far exceeded the historically recorded monopoly powers in our, in our lifetime, what we have seen. So what is the kind of uh, uh, implications of that you see for Asia? And I would say that, okay, based on that, Professor Kuhnley might reflect upon what is it, this is it going to have any kind of implications on, on the catch up, whatever. So I would like oh. to ask a question to both of you, Korean. Okay. Thank you for the question. Actually, that was the question I wanted to ask uh, Kuhn. Uh, thank you. Uh, at the moment, the, we are uh, living an age of digital transformation where there is network effect. Network effect means, uh, uh, as for the company, the more customers you have, mm -hmm. customers would like your company's product. So that means that uh, the early entrant has uh, uh, has advantage over the follower. That means that the catching up is more difficult. Okay, so. When I stayed in uh, Thailand in uh, 2018, I could see a lot of my colleagues uh, uh, being frustrated about the future because of network effect. That's what the uh, Vendoka Lumbar is talking about, uh, monopoly. Uh, but um, uh, the, the future, the, the challenge is uh, for currently, what is your thought? Uh, that is, uh, in, in the face of this one, many people would think that uh, catching up would be less possible than before. Then the, our question would be, yes, we are likely to say the less possible, but uh, in, in that case, there can be also window, there can be, if you, if you turn down the same book, you can see the opportunity, okay? Then uh, what would be, in the, in the case of this uh, phase, what would be opportunity? I mean, there might be the, the, the reason why we have this kind of question, yeah? Or, or this kind yeah. of uh, occasion. So I would my thought one. is, okay, before going further, mm -hmm. my thought is that if there's network effect, then, then for developing country, one of the way would be go first. Going first is, is possible, through uh, uh, global uh, collaboration in the, because we are living in the digital age, it's because of internet, this global connection is much easier. So that would be opportunity, some would say. So I would just give this kind of context. Yeah, yeah. And what would be your response, Kun? Yeah. So I would respond to a, first of all, of course there are, network effect present in many uh, areas. But at the same time, those uh, uh, data flap industry, it is so cycle. That means they're facing frequent innovation, which often disruptive. Well, this is where creative disruption is more often happening. So you see like Facebook, 
they were number one in the one time, but now they're facing decline because of new innovation coming up. So that's why in soul cycle, many new disruption is happening. That's where we can see some found some window opportunity for latecomers to jump in. So, so in the sense, net effect is also depending upon some vintage of capital or technologies. So I see there are some prospect of late entry. Second, net effect sometimes facing national boundary. For example, like in the uh, uh, Grab in South Asia, although Uber and others are first mover in US, there are still local company based in South Asia, like Grab is happening. So in the main, there are some limitation in net effect across boundaries. So, so Lacoma still have uh, some uh, imitative uh, style of businesses. Business model, you don't have to be a uh, technical innovation leaders. You can be a first mover in business model in your own territory, in your own market. You don't have to be uh, real hardcore innovators. As long as you are first mover in business model, it's okay. Yeah, uh, Professor Patrapong, having worked so much on Thailand and living for, I think, last almost a decade in the, more than a decade, I suppose, in Japan, and with your experience with the West, I would like to know, ask, and you asked the question to Professor uh, Kirli, uh, how do you really, are you able to really influence? You know, doing research is one thing. I know you are an action man. You are a person who, wants to things seeing happening. So I wanted to ask you, for example, from your understanding, what is the maturity of the institutional architecture in the Asian countries? You know, you need to have an appropriate institutional architecture for a, for a, for a vibrant innovation system of the type that you have been advocating. And how are they prevalent across different countries? And in the current juncture of growing challenge and particularly I'm, we must also note that Asia has been able to come up in a big way through their innovation capability to address the once in a, a century uh, COVID. Having said this, how do you think the institutional architecture, how, how widespread it is in the ASEAN, for example, now we have got problematic in South Asia, including Sri Lanka. So what do you think the future prospects of an innovation driven? And how sound is the, 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 the innovation architecture support system? That What do you think for an effective policy articulation and so on and so forth? Which I'm asking the question back to you. We can push it to Professor Kuli after you are with answer. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, KJ. I, I think uh, living in Japan, and I have seen uh, Japanese companies, uh, large and small, and also local government policy, uh, local government research institute or in Japanese, Kosesushi. I think this is quite important because in many developing countries, we don't have a research institute that belong to the local government. So the local government is quite weak and in Japan, the local government much stronger. They can issue bond. They have. They can deploy policy towards the uh, university that they take responsibility. So they have city level university. They have prefecture level university. So all of this under the local government. So they have to follow the local government policy, and they also they. Uh, the, the the big difference is there that they have research institute under the local government to take care of the local SME problems. Most of developed country, I'm not sure about Korea. I don't think Korea have this kind of local government owned research institute at the city levels, which taking care of the niche area. But in Japan, that make much different, and in terms of income distribution in terms of strengthening the local SMEs. I think Japan is still much better than any newly industrializing economy, including Korea as well. So in it because of that egalitarian concept and the empowerment of the local government, 
it makes Japan is standing out. And when it comes into uh, like a situation like COVID, and Japanese economy is much more resilient compared to Korean or Taiwanese economy because of that. This is my take. I don't know whether you agree, Kun. Well, I, I think... want to, Professor Kunli, I just want to add on to one point uh, because you may be remembering the Oita Prefecture, uh, Mr. Hiramatsu, who was the who was the MITI officer and the governor of uh, 25 years. He was governor in Oita Prefecture. He came with the idea of one village, one product program in, in the prefecture of Oita that became one tambon, one product in, and in, in India also we now, all Southeast, all the Asian countries imitated that. In India, we call it ODOP, one product, one uh, district, one product. So I think uh, I, I really, and this, I appreciate uh, uh, Professor Patrapong highlighted this point. And again, I would say, I'm sure there is, this could also be seen in uh, Professor Kunli's framework, I'm very sure. Over to you, Professor Kunli. Yeah, yeah. If I say from the, my framework was our innovation system framework, I think this institutional uh, the, uh, difference, institutional architecture is, is the issue of uh, multi-layer uh, uh, in the university you know, system. In other words, there is a, if you turn to government, government has several layers, central government, provincial government, or city, and so on. And then there exists a gap across these government layers in terms of their knowledge, competence in policy formulation, implementation, and so on. That's the important issues in a uh, national innovation system. And, uh, uh, if Patrapong is right, Japan is uh, uh, ahead of other countries in terms of more effective way of mobilizing this multi day of government. But, uh, but I, I think that, that can be a, a lesson for other countries because this important uh, policy changes in, in terms of uh, not only the policy formulation, but also if you turn to policy implementation, this uh, uh, multi, issue, multi day issue is important uh, in national human system. That's why we look at not only national, but also regional or sectoral or lower dimension of the system. Yeah. Keiji, but I think we are facing time limit. I think we have to. Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, now uh, we should not be testing the patience of the, of, the, of the organizers and participants. I thought it was a really enlightening evening. Thanks to our wonderful colleagues. And for me, it was a great pleasure meeting all of them. And it was also a great pleasure for me to meet all our Globalix friends. Uh, Radosvik just left, I suppose, and all others. So I would like to, uh, I'm, I'm not venturing into uh, summarizing the thing, but the fact of the case, to say it in few words. It is rather remarkable that Asia's overall economic transformation has attracted world attention, and rightly so. And it is um, India, in, and, and it is 21st century is touted to be Asia century. And we, as Asian innovation scholars, I would say that uh, uh, Professor Kunli and others, we have significantly, we can take pride being a part of that, and we have been able to throw our own in our own insights to the problematic as it evolved, right from Japan in the 50s, the the the, the fleeing Greece paradigm. And from then to South Korea, now to uh, China and India, and all other ASEAN countries. At first, I had an opportunity to work with ASEAN, most dynamic group. And I would say that we as academic, academicians can take the pride. And I'm very happy that in the whole effort, uh, Professor Kunli has been eminently successful in articulating a uh, uh, articulating a framework or an approach to understanding, towards understanding this dynamic and this particular framework built within the paradigm of innovation system and also drawn from the institutional economics and Schumpeterian contribution. It is going to be eminently useful in understanding the future trajectory as well. I congratulate once again, Professor Kunli. I congratulate Professor John Matthews for his incredible contribution in certain unique areas, and Professor Lin Su, and Professor Lim for his uh, emerging, uh, his enormous contribution on the catch up and on the emerging issues. And my dear friend, Professor Patrick Pong, uh, I know he's a 
incredibly because i worked to, to with all of them and uh, his own commitment towards building innovation sound innovation systems in developing countries towards making the much needed technology and much needed socio economic transformation and uh, i thank the organizers for providing this wonderful forum uh, for this and uh, i'm sure we as asians we need to stand together we need to work together and particularly in the emerging world which is not not this not, one the world that we are seeing today is not the one that is very desired not desirable for us as scholars and we need to work together to see a world which is different not war mongering not working for peace and prosperity and looking at the downtrodden and looking at the left behind and 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 getting rid of the greed and and saving the environment and ensuring a sustainable development with these words i thank all of you and kudos to my dear friend and 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 the hero of the day professor kunli keep it up all the best thank you thank you, thank you. good well Bye. done kun very good thank you for the organizing efforts thank, thank you, you. Yes, yes, thank everybody you. Yes, yes. Thank you very thank much. You very I much. take this opportunity thank to you. thank you. Professor thank KJ. You and uh, yes, and, and it is because of of Professor KJ. It was it was such an engaging uh, conversation that initially we had it for two hours and time just flew. It was so engaging. It was lots and lots of things from with uh, from Professor Kuli, which has come up because of a, a very nice discussion and the intervention of all of you. And extremely thankful to the panelists, Professor John Matthews, Professor Petru Pong, Professor- Thank Dutton. you, so it's- Extremely late in your it's part of- It's minutes past midnight here. Yes, and and it was it is our pleasure to have uh, you here, and uh, we are so delighted to have a wonderful panel, a wonderful discussion, and many congratulations to uh, Professor Kelly, Professor KJ for for the wonderful session. And please do join us for the next event uh, with conversation with Professor John Katz. And uh, see you next time. And with this, uh, yeah, thanks once again. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. 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 Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very well done. I, we must congratulate you for, for holding this conversation together. It was excellent. Yes. Now we feel that we should have a few programs dedicated to the global south and Asia. Yeah, yeah. So we will we will we will together we will come to you for advice and we will we will organize yes. something for the for the Asian region. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Bye. In the teacher round of <laughs> I will definitely convey your regards. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.